finish up the uh, lecture component talking about uh, the treatment of low-grade glioma after the diagnosis has been made. And so I've entitled this Low-Grade Gliomas to Treat, When to Treat, or Not to Treat. That is the question. And you notice that I didn't include the question what to treat with because there is, in fact, controversy about uh, when to treat um, and further controversy about how to treat. Next slide, please. So the, the topics I'd like to touch on are uh, the discussion of prognostic factors, as I think this is an important component in our decision-making process um, regarding treatment. I'm going to talk a little bit about the potential role of radiation therapy and uh, also about chemotherapy. Next slide. So the, the big question in low-grade glioma, given their uh, biologic and prognostic diversity um, as compared with our, our more uh, typical uh, brain tumor, the glioblastoma, there's a much wider variety of uh, prognostic features um, in low-grade glioma. And if you look at the literature, the reports are quite variable. Um, as Dr. Liao pointed out, um, there are uh, quite a dif uh, diverse uh, selection of grade 2 glioma. Um, some studies of low-grade glioma have, in fact, included the grade 1, like pilocytic. And the pleomorphic xanthroastrocytoma, although uh, graded as a WHO grade 2, is biologically quite distinct. Um, from either the oligodendroglioma or the astrocytoma. If we look in the literature, there's also certainly an impact um, in the studies on, on when the studies were performed. Uh, with the, um, the use of MRI, we certainly were making the diagnosis earlier and the extent of uh, tumor involvement uh, much more accurately with the use of uh, flare-type imaging. And more recently, um, we've come to recognize that oligodendroglioma is a more prevalent type of uh, brain tumor uh, than we had previously appreciated, and as Dr. Liao pointed out, the very important recognition of the 1P19Q uh, loss heterozygosity. Next slide, please. So if we look at some of the very important papers on prognosis, probably the, the seminal article was published in 2002 uh, from Pignati and colleagues, and this is a compilation of uh, patients uh, and their prognosis, prognostic factors from EORTC trials. We see several important prognostic factors. They used an age cutoff of 40, uh, showing, in fact, that there was a statistically significant association uh, and worse prognosis with older age. Um, tumor size, and they used a cutoff of uh, 6 centimeters. Uh, tumor crossing midline, the histology with astrocytoma being worse than oligodendroglioma. Uh, whether the patient had a neurologic deficit, and then if you compiled all those and gave each a, a score of one, you can see the difference uh, between those patients who had all good prognostic factors with a score of zero, having a median survival of 9.2 years versus less than one year if you had all five as a, a prognostic factors. Next slide. A more recent study published in 2009 from the Mayo Clinic shows much of the same thing. They looked at both uh, progression-free survival uh, as well as overall survival, and for progression-free survival using a cutoff of 5 centimeter diameter uh, found that the larger tumors had a worse progression-free survival as well as overall survival. And then uh, uh, getting back to some of the, the data that uh, Dr. Berger uh, reviewed and showed so eloquently the difference between um, a tumor resection versus a, a small biopsy, you can see either a gross total or subtotal resection highly associated with an improvement in progression-free survival as well as overall survival. Additionally, as we've seen before, histology, astrocytic tumors having a worse prognosis, uh, neurologic symptoms, um, and the use of postoperative XRT in the Mayo Clinic experience was also associated with actually a better prognosis. Next slide, please. Turning now to a, a different experience, this is from uh, our colleagues in uh, Canada, London, Ontario looking at 145 patients with low-grade glioma. When they did a univariate analysis, they again also showed age. Uh, those patients who presented with neurologic symptoms, so uh, something other than seizures, those with a poor per performance status, a subtotal resection, um, and those who had immediate radiation therapy, um, and again, astrocytoma. But when they did a multivariate analysis in this group, only age, performance status, uh, subtotal resection, and the astrocytic histology uh, it came to be important prognostic factors. Next slide. 
So in that context of trying to decide um, which patients um, are, have the worst prognosis and probably warrant uh, earlier treatment, we now look at how we've done and how we've approached the, the uh, therapy for patients with low-grade glioma. And in fact, if we look in the literature and, and uh, being part of the, the, the generation that was involved in these treatments, we look and we see in the 1970s through 1990s, there really was not a consistent approach. There were, in fact, several important studies uh, performed by the RTOG, the EURTC, and the North Central Group uh, out of the Mayo Clinic, which helped us define uh, some of the parameters, particularly for radiation therapy, but no true consensus. In the mid-1990s, recognizing uh, the need to, to sort of approach this more scientifically, the RTOG undertook uh, an effort to develop some consensus. They'd extensively reviewed the available literature and from that created the RTOG 9802 study. Um, the initial hypothesis for this trial was to see in patients with low-grade glioma whether radiation therapy or radiation therapy combined with, at that point, the standard brain tumor chemotherapy, the combination of procarbazine, CCNU, and vincristin, was superior. Um, and then, more recently, um, we're getting into the molecular era, and as Dr. Liao alluded to, um, the chromosomal analysis of 1P19Q uh, has a, a been of a great interest. Next slide. But the 9802 um, was really a very important study in the low-grade glioma field looking at radiation and chemotherapy, but even more importantly, recognizing the potential importance of prognostic factors, this study divided patients into a good and poor prognostic group. So the low risk or good prognostic group was defined as patients who were less than age of 40 who had a gross total tumor resection. Those who were considered high risk or poor performance were either over age 40 or had a subtotal resection. So by this definition, if you were under 40 and had a subtotal resection, you were still considered to be in the high risk category. Next slide, please. So the study design was quite straightforward. If you were low risk, meaning under age 40, and had a uh, total resection, you um, were just observed. Uh, and that was the consensus that these patients uh, oftentimes did quite well without any additional therapy. In the high-risk group, they were randomized to receive either radiation therapy alone or radiation therapy combined with the procarbazine CCNU vincristin or PCV chemotherapy. Next slide. The eligibility criteria for this study, they had to have histologic proof of uh, low-grade glioma and included the astrocytic tumors, the oligodendrogliomas, and the mixed oligoastrocytomas. It had to be adults performance status by Karnofsky rating had to be greater than or equal to 60, and they allowed um, a 12-week window from the time of uh, a surgical procedure uh, to randomization. Next slide. So the, ran the observation arm uh, was published uh, two years ago in the Jour Journal of Neurosurgery. Uh, they were able to accrue 111 patients. Again, these were the good risk patients under age 40 with gross total resection and we see um, a quite striking results, and that is um, that at a five-year point, um, more than half of the patients had tumor progression. But what was most interesting uh, was that the risk factors for progression were those patients who had an astrocytic or mis mixed histology, and the prognosis was much better for those patients who had pure oligodendroglioma. And the other risk factors were those patients who had larger tumors when we uh, when they uh, went into uh, their surgical procedure, and also in a uh, post-surgical and post-hoc analysis, reviewing the post-operative Im imaging studies, those patients who truly did not have a gross total resection, uh, but had more than a centimeter of residual tumor. Next slide. There have been some uh, very well done studies looking at the role of radiation therapy in low grade glioma. Three large cooperative group trials were performed. These were randomized studies. The EORTC, the European group, uh, did what was called the non believer study. This took a group of patients with low grade glioma and randomized them to observation versus uh, 54 gray of radiation therapy. It was not truly an observation arm, 
those patients who were randomized to observation receive radiation therapy of progression, and there was no statistically significant difference in survival. The URTC also did a low dose, relatively low dose versus high dose uh, treatment, randomizing patients to either 45 gray or nearly 60 gray, and again, there was no statistically significant difference in survival. And the NCCTG uh, did also a low dose versus high dose study, and again, did not see a statistically significant difference in survival, although there was certainly more uh, neurotoxicity at the higher dose. Next slide. So the conclusions we can draw from the, these radiation studies um, were that early versus late radiation did not improve survival in this group of low-grade gliomas. Although I didn't discuss the data, it did prolong uh, progression-free survival with early radiation. However, given the potential risk of radiation causing a neurologic harm, uh, it was unclear and not tested in this study what it meant for quality of life and neurocognitive function. Was it better to wait uh, till there was tumor progression or to do the early uh, radiation therapy? We don't have an optimal dose, but there appears in several randomized trials to be no apparent gain from the higher doses. And in fact, most subsequent studies have used an intermediate dose, not the lowest dose of 45 gray and certainly not the highest dose of 64 gray, but somewhere between 54 and 57 gray. Next slide. Turning now back to the uh, 9802 study, the RTOG trial, and looking at the group of high-risk patients, those over or with subtotal resection or both, who were randomized to receive either radiation therapy or radiation therapy plus PCB. They used the 54 gray radiation in 30 fractions. They went to the tumor volume based on a post-operative MRI scan plus a two centimeter margin. Um, those patients who were randomized to receive the adjuvant uh, chemotherapy used six cycles of the PCB. Next slide. And what was interesting was at the preliminary results, the addition of PCB did not improve overall survival, but did in improve progression-free survival. However, subsequent analysis revealed that beyond two years, the addition of PCB did show both the survival and progression-free survival benefit. It suggests that there may be a delayed benefit for the chemotherapy, but it's very hard to know what to do with this delayed data. However, there was a significant difference between the two treatment arms as there was a high rate of myelotoxicity, bone marrow suppression, in the group receiving chemotherapy. And this has brought up the question whether or not, had this study been done with temozolomide, which is much less uh, myelotoxic, whether the results would have been the same with the toxicity being less. Furthermore, given the potential marker of 1P19Q um, chromosomal loss being a potential marker of chemosensitivity, um, would this study be different if, in fact, patients were stratified? And, in fact, a 1P19Q analysis is underway to apply it to these data. Next slide. So what are the other data regarding chemotherapy? If you look in the literature, there are several reports that re uh, describe results in, a, in groups of patients with low-grade glioma. However, these are quite variable in nature. So there are reports of patients getting chemotherapy as their initial treatment after a diagnostic procedure or surgery. Um, there are reports of patients getting radiation with adjuvant chemotherapy, much like the experimental arm in the 9802 study, and there are reports uh, in patients with recurrent disease. There are also variable uh, inclusions of different histologic subtypes. There are some that are isolated to just oligodendroglioma or astrocytoma. Others uh, have various combinations of the astrocytic neoplasms, the mixed, or the pure oligodendroglioma. Next slide. And this table uh, provides a, a, a bit of a review of the studies that have been published in, in the literature. Um, and you can see um, that there have been a, a wide variety of studies. The numbers, are, numbers of patients in each study are, are actually quite limited, as low as uh, the 26 and as high as 60. But again, the pathologies tend to be somewhat mixed. Um, you can see the percentage of enhancement, uh, which in some circumstances, particularly recurrent disease, may be an indicator that the, the tumor has undergone malignant transformation, but if not sampled, uh, would be still graded as a grade two uh, 
neoplasm, um, but you do see a variety of response rates and uh, some evidence, certainly, of efficacy with the use of chemotherapy, both in the newly diagnosed patient population as well as in recurrence. Next slide, please. There are uh, several trials that are uh, ongoing now that will try to address the potential role of, of chemotherapy in low-grade glioma. There's currently ongoing an ERTC trial, which takes patients with what they've defined as poor-risk low-grade glioma and randomize them after a surgical procedure to either receive the conventional radiation or single-agent temozolomide. And then there is an ongoing study, which is an intergroup study in the United States and Canada, uh, the Eastern Cooperative Group, the North Central uh, Cancer Treatment Group, and the Radiation Therapy Oncology Group, uh, which is comparing, and again, uh, high-risk patients with low-grade glioma radiation alone uh, versus uh, what we now call the STUP regimen, which is concurrent temozolomide and radiation followed by uh, single-agent temozolomide for up to 12 months. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, um, there is, at this point, no full consensus on management of newly diagnosed low-grade glioma. However, um, I think most would agree on maximum safe debulking of tumor, and I think the data that Dr. Berger showed was quite compelling. The, the decision regarding postoperative treatment, we often base actually on extent of resection and age. Um, the younger patients with uh, extensive resection, many of us would feel quite comfortable in observing those patients, particularly if it's an oligodendroglioma. Once treatment is warranted, um, the question whether to give the patients chemotherapy or radiation therapy, that decision has not yet well uh, been defined well. Some would advocate chemotherapy, particularly if there is the uh, co-deletion of 1P and 19Q. I would also say that the results from the RTOG 9802 study have provided some important information. Uh, we now have uh, some better information about natural history and prognosis in patients with low-grade oligodendroglioma and astrocytic tumors, um, and we see, in fact, that they are biologically distinct. And we have confirmation now of the prognostic factors of age, performance status, um, extensive resection, in addition to histology, which we already thought was quite important. Um, and we'll get further information as the 1P19Q and other molecular uh, marker studies are done uh, from the, the patients on 9802. I think most would agree that chemotherapy has a role in recurrent low-grade glioma, um, and there may be potentially benefit in newly diagnosed. We, we certainly have an advantage now. The temozolomide that was now our standard chemotherapy for brain tumors has a much better toxicity profile uh, compared with PCV. Thank you very much.